Hi everyone, I'm Megan Herman and I'm a conference programmer here at South by Southwest. Welcome to another South by Southwest session online with special guest Rohit Bhargava. Rohit is on a mission to inspire more non-obvious thinking in the world. He's a popular speaker at South by Southwest every year and his 2020 session was one of the most favorited sessions in our online schedule. Today he will take you inside his Wall Street Journal best-selling trend report and share four mega trends that are changing our culture along with ways you can use them to survive in disruptive times. That's it for me. So without further ado, get ready to be a non-obvious thinker with Rohit Bhargava. Welcome everyone to the South by Southwest session, non-obvious megatrends. I am representing with my non-obvious glasses. And though we can't gather at South by Southwest, I'm trying to bring a little bit of that energy to you. Maybe with fewer cocktails, maybe depending on what time of day it is for you, more cocktails. It depends on who you are, I think. I am so excited to share with you some of the trends that I would have shared in person. And, and before I do that, I just want to say a big thank you to the entire team at South by Southwest. I know it's just it was a devastating moment when uh, we couldn't gather together. And I know it's been really hard for a lot of people, uh, much harder than it is for anybody like me who was just going to turn up as a speaker and, and share some insights and have a good time. And so I just want to give a big, big shout out and lots of love to the entire team at South by and the entire community at Austin. I mean, that's been a great home for me. I've been going to South by for more than the last 10 years. And, you know, it's funny, the first time that I ever went uh, to South by, I went to the music festival and my entire job, no joke, was to go and take coasters and put them out at bars for a company that was sponsoring and then make sure that the bars had put the coasters out. So I wasn't speaking, I wasn't doing anything. Uh, and since then, uh, lots of stuff has happened and I've been speaking there now, uh, most recently for the last two years on featured sessions and, and just sharing insights. And so today, I'm super, super excited to share with you some of the trends that are not only important for us right now, but that have started to matter even more during this moment of a pandemic. And I've been thinking about this a lot. I've been doing a lot of these virtual sessions from home, from my home office, which you see around me here. And uh, I've discovered a couple of things that, that have surprised me. And a lot of people have asked, look, you published a book two months before the pandemic about trends. So is it still right? I mean, <laughs> did, did everything change? I mean, everything did change, right? So like, how, uh, how has it done? How has it fared? We're going to talk about that. Uh, and my goal today is really going to be to give you some trend insights that you can use, but also to take you inside what the process looks like. And I'm actually really excited about doing it in this format, because what I'm going to be able to do is share with you like some of the things that I use on a consistent basis. So I'm going to be able to you know talk to you about like this board right here, right, and like what this whole thing looks like for me in terms of the process for what I put together. And I'll try and you know not kill everything in my office while I do that. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about this book, which is Non-Obvious Megatrends. This is the one that I would have shared with all of you. And as many of you know, this book is the 10th anniversary edition of a project that's been going on for me for an entire decade. And so what I've been doing for that whole time is as I've been publishing a new version of this report, first of all, as an as a online report for the first couple of years. And then in 2015, I did it as a, as a full-length book. And so this is the, the first version of the book right here. Um, which uh, some of you have. Uh, then I did a second version, which was not that that intelligently done, I think, only because uh, the year was printed like super small in the corner, like you can kind of see it like right here, um, but it's hard to see. And so we fixed that and the book really started to take off in 2017. So we had a new version in 2017. We had uh, another version in 2018. That's the 2018 one. And in uh, 2019, eventually, uh, culminating in the last version, which is the Megatrends uh, version of the book. And so what I'm going to do now is uh, share with you some of the insights from uh, Megatrends and uh, really how I think about the world. And so um, I've, got some, I've got some visuals for that. I'm a very visual guy. I'm a visual speaker typically. And though this is a little bit different because I'm not kind of standing up on stage, I got to admit, I'm sort of liking this format because I feel like I can I can lean in I can I can grab my glasses when I need them uh, and, and I feel like we're maybe we're having a, a little bit more of a one-to-one -one, uh, style of presentation so I'm, I'm kind of uh, embracing that uh, a little bit and, and by the way I, I think that the other piece of good news is I know that in past years 
Uh, some of you have been really disappointed because uh, you haven't been able to get into the room or the timing didn't work or there's just lots and lots of stuff going on at South by right so there's lots of conflicts. And now we get a moment of uninterrupted time together so I'm really excited about that so let's let's get started let's go. Uh, and, and the first thing that I wanted to share is just this idea of this word that we're hearing lots and lots of, which is uh, essential. Like, am I essential? Like, uh, what is essential? Like, who is essential, right? And, um, and, and it really is, is concerning for a lot of people because we're discovering that maybe we're not as essential as we thought we were. I mean, not as, not as humans. I mean, of course, as people, we're essential. But the work that we do. Uh, and 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 trying to discover like what is really meaningful, like what really matters. And you know, like I said, I've been writing about this for many, many years. This is kind of the whole series of the book for for many years. And and what one of the things that many people will assume after they look at this body of work is that I focus on the future, so I must be a futurist. And the truth is, I've never described myself as a futurist. And the reason why is because what I tend to focus on is really trying to observe today to figure out what to do today. I'm not as focused on where's the world going to be five years from now, 10 years from now. And there's some amazing futurist work that focuses just on that, but that doesn't tend to be my angle. And the other thing that I don't usually focus on as much is where's technology going to go just by itself, because I'm interested in that. And I love technology, but my real focus and what I care most about is how is our behavior evolving? Like, what can we understand about people and in turn about ourselves by paying attention to trends, by paying attention to all these things that are happening in the world? And so, you know, that's where, where I really try and focus. And, and look, we're in a time of, of lots and lots of change. And you're probably hearing the same cliches for how we describe those changes over and over again. Uh, unprecedented times, right? We're in a time of constant disruption. People talk about the new normal. I mean, there's, there's so many cliches that you're probably even sick of hearing. Uh, a lot of those. And, and I am too. The good news is uh, I'm not going to try, I'm going to try really hard not to focus on those. And instead, what I'm going to try and do is just paint a picture of the world as it is. And look, uh, it's different because the cities that we're used to being full are empty. And so maybe our response naturally, human response is to just go backwards and, and, and stream more content. I mean, there's no reason anybody would watch Tiger King unless we had extra time to watch something that silly, right? But we do because we have these moments. But, but the change that's happening now, and the biggest thing I could tell you, if there's one thing that I've realized over this period of time, it's that the change that's happening now is evolving faster because of the pandemic. And you're going to see that theme in many different places. So a lot of the stories that I've been tracking, I mean, things like the holographic wife that was a real product out of Japan a couple of years ago that I've been talking about for some time, or now uh, in, in stadium, in baseball stadiums in Japan, they have robot spectators because people can't go. Or in Singapore, they've got a robot dog that I just wrote about a story this two weeks ago robot dog that encourages social distancing by watching how close people are to one another and issuing verbal warnings when they get too close to one another. So creepy, yes. Interesting, also yes. And that's the sort of story that we're seeing lots and lots of. So two years ago, a company called Apple Stone Meats created vending machines where you could buy fresh meat from a vending machine. Now that's looking like a brilliant idea, right? Because two years later when a pandemic, this is a perfect way to avoid even going into the store and getting fresh fruit and they're taking off. There's lots of crazy new products. I mean, this was one that I saw online of a hand sanitizer spray. So it's almost like a Spider-Man style, like shooter thing where you can shoot hand sanitizer into probably your hands, but maybe at people who seem like they might need some, uh, maybe that's an alternate version of this. I haven't actually seen a video of how it works, but like there's, there's really fascinating inventions like this that we're seeing more and more. I mean, face masks are becoming or have already become fashion accessories. And we're seeing that more and more because people are saying, well, look, even when we get back to being able to do the things that we were doing before, we're going to start wearing face masks. And so we need to have a different way of thinking about it. I mean, even handshakes are being questioned and reinvented. Do we want to shake hands anymore? Is it even polite? I mean, there was a group that makes etiquette rules that I read about, uh, again, a couple of weeks ago that said it's no longer polite to shake hands. In fact, it's rude 
to expect someone to shake your hand now. Instead, maybe we use the, the namaste um, from India. Maybe we bow. Maybe we, we have even weirder ways of greeting each other, like jazz hands. I mean, maybe that's the greeting. Hopefully not. Hopefully not. Because, uh, you know, this is not my favorite way to greet somebody. But the thing is, we have questions. We have big questions about how these things are going to change the way that we do everything. I mean, the way that our careers evolve, the way that we do our next uh, internship, if we were just about to enter the world, are we going to go back to school? What are we going to do with these kids who are homeschooling and, and sort of always uh, around us now, uh, working from home? Those of us who were lucky enough, like I was lucky enough to be working from home for a long time. So I knew what that's like, but like, that's a new dynamic too. So all of these things are big questions. And when it comes to business, one of the big questions that we're seeing is like, should we even be selling? Like what trends affect what we do and, and how do we tell our story? And that's so important, right? To be able to tell our story in a way that resonates with people. And I have talked, if you've seen any of my past talks uh, at South by Southwest or videos or anything like that, you know, like I spent a lot of time thinking about how to tell stories because stories are what help us connect with one another. And in the marketing sense, being able to tell stories in a persuasive way is really what great marketing is all about. And I spent most of my career in, in the marketing and advertising space, right? And so I really started thinking about this and particularly about stories and what we need right now. And I want to tell you a little bit of a story just to give you an analogy for this. And I, I came across this video, which was just uh, amazing. And I'd seen it maybe two years ago already, but I saw it again and it really got me thinking. It was a video from The Greatest Showman, but it wasn't from the movie, which you might have seen. It was a video before uh, it was released after the movie, but it was recorded before the movie. And it was basically a, the director and one of the stars of the film, Kiala Settle, talking about her being in an audition room, doing the song, her iconic song that became really famous afterwards, This Is Me, for the first time in the chorus. And as they paint the picture of this room, they're sort of talking about how when she was in there, she was really shy and she was kind of standing behind the music stand and she was reluctant to come out. Uh, naturally. And the song is about her coming out and finding herself. Uh, that's what the topic of the song is. And so the director said, look, you got to come out from behind that music stand. And she was still really apprehensive. And you can see it in the video and you'll see a link below. Um, oops, sorry, I forgot to change the link. So I'll, um, I'll shift the link uh, across, but it's actually nonobvious.com slash South by Southwest. So um, working too fast here. Um, but basically she's telling the song and uh, she's singing it. And as she's, uh, as she's singing the song, you see her kind of emerge from behind the music stand. And as she emerges from behind the music stand, there's one moment where there's a guy who is uh, sort of singing a solo. And you see him come out and sing the solo and he stands on this chair and he sings this solo like full force, right? You, like you just see him like full energy singing the solo. And right when he finishes singing that solo, you see her turn around and, you, and she has this like new energy. She finds this new energy. And it's an amazing, amazing moment to watch on film because you see the entire energy of the entire room change from this guy. And as I watched this video, I just kept thinking to myself, like in this time of disruption where we just don't know what to think and what to do, like that's maybe that's what we need. Like we just need a guy to stand on a chair at the right time. Like we need somebody to come out and share that message in a really engaging, interesting way that, that causes us to be uh, inspired. And I thought a lot about that because I feel like we all have moments in our daily lives where we can do that. I mean, of course, I have a moment right now where hopefully I can do that for you, right? Because you're listening to me. I have a South by Southwest session and, and we're together. But in your life, you're going to have moments when you can do that for other people. And I think that that is just this, this interesting way of thinking about like what we can give to one another in this moment, which is like sometimes we can be that person standing on that chair for someone who really needs us to. And it's a powerful opportunity. And it's one that I, that I hope you take advantage of and that I always try and, and take advantage of myself. But it also got me thinking about just the state of the world. And this is one of the things that I have talked about often, this, this believability crisis. And I'm going to share with you a link to a place where you can watch some of my past videos and my past featured sessions. And you'll see some of the stories and the way that I put those together. And what I tried hard to do in this talk is not duplicate too much of that. 
a lot of times it's easy to just take the same talk and sort of slap in a couple of new slides and, and do it. But I've really tried to reinvent the process of how I'm putting these things together to try and make it more interesting, to try and bring in different content. And you can watch some of those videos as, as complementary things. But I think that ultimately what this believability crisis that I've often talked about comes down to is we just don't know what to trust. And so we're going to do a super quick exercise. We're going to do something a little bit interactive, right? You can do it by yourself. And all you need to do is read the headlines that I'm going to share with you. And they are going to be three stories. And for each one, I want you to decide for yourself whether that story is a real story or whether it's a fake story. So I could have doctored up the headlines and the logo, or it might be a real story. And so I want you to try and decide for yourself. Okay. Are you ready? Okay, here we go. First story, chemical in McDonald's fries could cure baldness. That's the first story. Second story, bumblebee vomit. Scientists are no longer ignoring it. Second story. Third story, sassy seal accidentally slaps man across the face with an octopus. All right, these are your three stories. Have you decided? For yourself, which ones are fake and which ones are real? I will give you exactly five seconds. Count in your head. Okay, big reveal. Here we go. First story: real chemical in McDonald's fries could cure baldness. How? Because some online writer says, "Oh, there's scientists who found a chemical that might regrow hair." Let me Google to see what else has that chemical in it. Oh, McDonald's fries. The headline basically writes itself, goes viral. This story, real. Second big story, bumblebee vomit. Scientists are no longer ignoring it. I mean, it's a good thing they're no longer ignoring it. It's been ignored for far, far too long, I think. Real story, New York Times, bumblebee vomit. And you may sense a pattern here. In fact, yes, the third story is real. Yes, sassy seal accidentally slaps man across the face with an octopus. So what are we seeing here? Well, you know, the big challenge, the big problem right now, I think, is that we just don't know what to believe and so we don't believe anything. And all of these books that you're seeing here kind of allude to the same idea that just the world seems untrustworthy and so we don't know what to pay attention to. And you know what 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 doesn't work like when we try and solve this problem like I'll tell you what doesn't work. What doesn't work is taking more, more time to scroll through everything and try and consume everything. Like that doesn't work. Because the thing is, like, we could focus on trying to be speed readers, right? And we could use tools like this one to flash words in front of us faster and faster to try and improve our reading speed. And, and you know, maybe it does improve our reading speed, but it also might give us a humongous headache at the same time. And the challenge for us is, you know, how do we try to figure out what's happening in the world and figure out what to believe when we're trying to consume everything because that's not the solution. Like when you try and consume everything, you don't actually get smarter. I mean, imagine you were super, super hungry, hadn't eaten anything for two or three days. And you eventually went to one of these hot dog eating competitions to like eat as many hot dogs as you could in a minute. You'd come out of that probably not hungry, but also not feeling very good. And, and you know, some, some of us are, are, are referring to, I mean, I've heard this called infobesity, right? Just taking in too much information and not being able to like figure out what to do with it. Uh, I've heard that uh, people are, are really struggling with a lot of these. And, and, you know, look, I am too. I get lots and lots of media. I get lots of input. And I struggle to try and do what I have often aspired to do, which is perfectly captured, I think, in this quote from Isaac Asimov, where he says, I'm not a speed reader. I'm a speed understander. <sighs> wow. I mean, a speed understander, like how amazing would that be to figure out what to pay attention to and not be overwhelmed by all of this stuff? I mean, wouldn't that be great if you could do that, if you could figure out how to make that happen? And I think that if you could do that, you would lead yourself towards what I believe may be actually the secret of really being successful now and in the future and in the past as well, which is better understanding people. Because the people who understand people always win. They're the ones who understand what motivates them to believe something, what gets them to act, what inspires them, what engages them. The people who understand people are the ones who win. And so how do we do that? How do we become that? Well, I'm going to share 
one method for doing it. And it's with five specific habits. These are the five habits of being what I call a non-obvious thinker. And then after I do that, for the rest of my talk, I'm going to focus on the megatrends, the four megatrends, and I'm going to give you what I call stealable insights. So real ways to use those megatrends to actually power your business to do something different. Before I do that, I want to give you a place, the actual place, to get access to all of that stuff. So I did have the wrong URL up before, working way too fast, mistake, but this is the correct URL. So if you go to nonobvious.com slash South by Southwest, you will not only get access to all the videos that I'm talking about. You'll also get access to my entire slide presentation. So all of the slides that I'm sharing with you now, I'll upload those after the talk. So just give me like an hour or so afterwards. You'll also get insights from the stories that I share. So every week, many of you know, I write an email and the email is uh, the most interesting stories of the week. And lately for the last couple of weeks, I've been doing it as a video show as well. And it's usually actually right now. It's usually Thursdays at noon Eastern uh, because I'm in DC. So that's you know local time for me. Uh, so translate that to whatever time it is for you. But since I'm doing this show here, we're doing a double header today. So if you wanna know the most interesting stories of the week uh, and you're not sick of me by the time this is over, uh, join in just half an hour later and you can join the show. And if you want this URL, you can either search for Non-Obvious Insights uh, episode 218, which is the episode that we've got, or you can just take a photo of this slide with the URL because I know it's hard. I can't make it clickable. There's no way to do that. So just take a photo of it and you can type it in if you want to go old school or if you uh, want to just search on YouTube, you should be able to find it pretty easily. So that's the URL to get all the slides, to get everything. Uh, eventually, I'm going to post all the, the videos there too. I've also got the videos from my past talks at South by Southwest as well as one of the things we did not release at all which we were going to, which is every year we've been curating the most interesting panels of the entire South by Southwest and putting together a list of the 60 or so most interesting panels. And we had that all done, ready to be printed. And then the uh, South by Southwest got canceled, so we didn't actually print it, but I have a PDF of that and you can download that on that same link. So lots and lots of stuff there. Definitely go there, check it out. If the email is interesting, you, you can sign up for that. You can also get a free copy of my latest book, which I'm gonna tell you about in a second, which is not the Megatrends book. So lots and lots of stuff there, but let's keep rolling. So the five habits, how to be a non-obvious thinker. So I wanna introduce this by giving you a little bit of a thought exercise, okay? So take a moment, and if you want to, you can close your eyes. Uh, I'm going to, which will be odd on camera, I know, but I'm gonna do it because I'm modeling, right? I'm hoping if I do it, then you do it. and Maybe that'll work, uh, but I don't know because I can't see you. So I'm gonna imagine that it works and that way it's good for both of us. Uh, imagine a flying horse. So take a moment, close your eyes. Imagine a flying horse. Okay. What did you picture? Well, many of you probably went with uh, a flying horse that has wings, um, which would be a natural thing. I mean, that's where, where a lot of people's minds go. What's fascinating about this exercise is if you ask it to a room full of uh, elementary school kids, like fourth and fifth graders, these are some of the designs that they come up with, uh, drawings that they come up with for their flying horse. And this was a drawing exercise for the kids. And, and a lot of times when I do it in a workshop, I'll do it as a drawing exercise, but since I didn't want to wait for you to draw it, and plus I can't check to see if you're drawing it anyway, I figured <laughs> let's imagine it anyway. But look at these horses, right? I mean, some of them are on, a, on an airplane, some of them are on helicopters, some of them are being jumping up and down on a bungee cord. I mean, one poor horse is getting shot out of a cannon. So he's probably not having the best day, right? But you see many, many different varieties for how a horse could fly. Because I never said, imagine a flying horse with wings. I just said, imagine a flying horse. And the point of this exercise is not to make you feel bad about how you chose to make your horse fly. Look, if your horse had wings, great. If your horse was on a helicopter, also great. There's not a right answer to this exercise. The point of the exercise is to say that if there was a thousand of you listening and I, all, and I asked all of you to imagine a flying horse, chances are many of you would imagine that horse flying in a different way. And the problem is a lot of times we go into a situation, we go into a meeting, we go into a conversation, and we assume that everyone else thinks the horse is flying the same way we think the horse is flying because we all know the horse is flying. And when we assume that we know how that horse got there, we 
don't connect on the same level because we're totally missing what someone else is thinking. And we never ask the question. And the reason I use this exercise is to encourage people to take a little bit of a step back and look outside of their own bubble. Look outside of your own worldview. I mean, look, it's really easy to read the same media that just reinforces what you already know and what you already think over and over again, but that is not the way to be open-minded. Instead, I believe if you embrace these five mindsets, you can be a non-obvious thinker. You can be more open-minded. So be observant. Pay attention to the details. Be curious. Ask bigger questions. Be fickle. Save an idea and move on. Let that idea uh, stay there for a while until the meaning becomes clear later. Be thoughtful and then be elegant. Be elegant means choose words very specifically. So this is the process that I use every year to come up with these trend insights. Every year there's new trend insights and many of you have seen kind of the process behind it. I mean, some of the things that, that I typically do is I read unusual books. So these are just some of the unusual books that I read. Um, these are some of the magazines uh, that I'm typically uh, sharing and uh, st saving ideas from. And this is what it looks like when I put all of those pieces together. But instead of just giving you visuals, I wanna show you a video to take you inside what this really looks like. So I'm gonna play that video now for you. And what you'll see in this video is you'll see the process that I go through to be able to kind of track all of the different stories that I'm seeing. So you're, what you're seeing is different stories being clipped together. You're seeing the relationship between those stories. You're seeing themes emerge, which is what's written on those cards. And then once the themes emerge, I group them together and I try and elevate the thinking. So I'm tr always trying to get the thinking to be higher and higher in terms of a bigger idea. And eventually that bigger idea turns into a trend and the trend is written, in this case, it's trend was truthing, which was a trend from the 2018 book. And then an outline uh, is developed for that particular chapter. And then that chapter becomes a chapter in the book. And this is sort of a, an overview of what this process looks like for me um, every year as I, as I do that. And uh, what's interesting about it is, is there's been people who've kind of talked about it and written about it. And one of the groups was a team at Microsoft that did a story about this whole process, which I call the haystack method, because you're gathering all the hay, which is the information, and then you stick your own needle in the middle of it. And that's the trend in my view. And so that's how I describe it. And uh, what's been fascinating is that they wanted to take uh, people inside that story. And so they shared a visual of what that story uh, looked like. And the visual involves some work because they said, look, we're going to, uh, we're going to actually need you to, to like stay still for a while so that we can set up this photo. And so I said, okay, I can do that. And, um, and they basically did this whole thing where we uh, did a post-it note based um, <laughs> photo shoot. So this is what it looked like when we actually did it. And what's, what's interesting about that, that, that you probably um, don't realize until you do it is there are, so, you know, regular post-it notes, like this is a regular post-it note. Like if I try and stick that on it, like it, it falls, it falls right off. Right. But like, this is a, a post-it note that is actually, um, oop, I lost my camera. Give me a second here. We're back. Um, this is a post-it note that uh, is an outdoor post-it note. And so when you stick an outdoor post-it note on, like that stays on, right? It doesn't go anywhere. And uh, that's what we used, outdoor post-it note. So anyway, um, totally irrelevant. I'm not even actually sure why I shared that with you, but uh, it was my opportunity to use post-it notes. And, and anybody who's a post-it note fan knows you take every opportunity you get for those post-it notes. And yes, I did. So anyway, um, what that leads to is what I call a non-obvious trend. And my definition for a non-obvious trend is a unique curated observation of the accelerating present. That's what I try and, and um, focus on. So a curated observation of the accelerating present. And look, we're in a moment now where the present is accelerating even faster than it had been before. And I wrote an entire article actually about 10 things that were happening faster as a result of COVID-19 right now. And you can find that on my blog, uh, just rohitbargava.com slash blog or on my, uh, on my LinkedIn profile, like it's on there as well. And it's just like interesting things that have been shifting and, and, and uh, sort of escalating uh, because of that. So we've talked around trends um, for a bit. And I shared that there's lots and lots of trends that I, that I write about in the past. And this is what a couple of them look like just from previous 
trend reports. But I want to take you inside, and what I've promised to do is take you inside four specifically. And so let's talk about uh, four megatrends that matter right now. And the first one that I want to share with you is a trend that I call revivalism. And revivalism is this sense that we can turn the clock backwards. Like we can look at the things that we used to believe and we used to trust and go back to them because we still believe and trust in them and we long for them in many cases. So, for example, listening to music on vinyl, which is something that had been happening for years now, um, and Kodak going back and making film again, like physical film for diehard photographers, or all of these shows that are making a comeback, uh, and like Picard that was just launched, which was a fabulous show, or He-Man, which uh, apparently is being relaunched, even though, let's be honest, it wasn't that good in the first place. But for some reason, like that's coming back. Or just, uh, just a week ago, I watched uh, this, which is Josh Gad reunited the cast of Back to the Future and had them do a couple lines from the show. And it was all a promo for the new Back to the Future uh, musical. And they had the cast of the new musical singing some of the songs like uh, from, the, from the movie. And, and it was just this piece of nostalgia, right? This piece of these things that we used to do before that we're trying to bring back. I mean, Heinz did this really clever campaign where they... Uh, created a, a diabolical puzzle that ha had all pieces that were the same shade of red, uh, which is, it looks like a, 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 a terrifying thing to try, I have to say. But uh, again, we're making puzzles more. We're playing board games. We're playing classic video games. And look, the, what all of this points to, the stealable idea that I think this points to is we are rediscovering the analog. We're rediscovering that we can do these things outside of technology. And that was happening. I mean, remember, these trends were written before the pandemic. So these are not mega trends that I invented since the pandemic happened. I mean, these are the ones that are printed in uh, in the book, and they've started to accelerate even more. And perhaps you've seen this in your own life too. And that's what happens sometimes with trends; like they they take off even faster because of the circumstances around us. And so, what I'm sharing with you are some trends that I think have done that, uh, and it's been really interesting to watch. Second trend I wanted to share with you is what I call the human mode. And the human mode is this idea that in a world where we had lots and lots of automation, lots and lots of technology, the experiences that were more human mattered more to us. They were of higher value and therefore we were perhaps willing to invest more in them, either financially or time-wise because they were so powerful. So we had, before the pandemic, we had these beautifully human empathetic experiences of grocery stores, mainly in the UK, that had started pioneering this idea of the relaxed checkout line. So the slow checkout line for people who felt like they needed more time or wanted to interact with the real person. And now, of course, because of the pandemic, like there are many, many stores that are opening earlier for senior citizens to offer that, that uh, experience where they're not everybody else is around. You know, there was, there was another um, uh, great example of uh, uh, celebrities who had uh, bookcases behind them. And as you saw all these celebrity bookcases, uh, you could learn something about someone from looking behind them. And some of you might be wondering, I mean, this, this might look like a, like a virtual background, but this is, this is actually my office. Like, this is what my office looks like. These are the bookshelves over here. There's another set of bookshelves over there. And, and so you're really, coming into my house for this talk. And it's really fascinating to be able to do that and to be able to have an opportunity to do that. And I think what it points to for all of these is this idea that we need to focus on empathy in the experiences that we try and offer. And when we're trying to promote or market something, and big question, look, I run in a lot of marketing circles and I've done a lot of talks with, with people who are in marketing or leaders. And a big question on their minds is, should we even be marketing right now? Should we even be selling right now? And I think the answer is, is yes, if you can do it with empathy, right? Because you have to acknowledge the situation that people are in and you have to be able to provide value for them. And if you can't do that, and if you can't deliver with empathy, then don't do it uh, because it's going to blow back in your face. But if you can do that and you can deliver something that has that empathy in it, of course, you should talk about it because people want that. People need that. The third trend I wanted to share is uh, instant knowledge. And instant knowledge is the idea that we now have access to information more readily than ever before. And what that means is that we expect to be able to learn anything faster. And so here's a simple idea. Here's a simple example. Tasty cooking videos that answer perhaps the most urgent question that many of us have on a daily basis, which is, 
what's for dinner? <laughs> what are we going to make? Especially when we have to cook more often ourselves. And what tasty cooking videos have done and the reason why they're so popular and so have gone so viral is they just show you the ingredients and they show you how to make something and it's just a time-lapse thing and you can learn from it, right? It's great. Uh, there's also an amazing app. It's one of my favorite apps. It's called Radio Garden where you can take your finger and move it around the world and listen to a radio station from anywhere in the world. I mean, what an amazing way to get outside of your bubble. Because a lot of us just read the same thing, reinforcing what we already think. And the problem with that is obvious. We become closed-minded. We think that anyone who doesn't think like us must be stupid. And that's a major problem in the world. And the only way to get outside of that is to get outside of your own bubble. I mean, that's your responsibility to do. You can't rely on your friends on Facebook to post something that's outside of your realm of what you typically read. It's not their job to do that. It's your own job to make yourself more open-minded. And this is one of those great, great apps that can let you do that. And one of my other tricks that I often talk about, that if you've seen me on stage, if you've been in one of my workshops, you know this as, as one of my favorite techniques, which is read a magazine that's not targeted at you. I'll read Teen Vogue magazine. I'll read Modern Farmer magazine. I mean, I just got a, a magazine about knives for hunters. I don't really hunt and I don't use knives to do the stuff that hunters do. But every time I get magazines like this, whether it's a magazine targeted at a 16-year-old girl or a Hispanic mom or a hunter who uses knives uh, to skin animals, like all of these things take me outside of my personal experience. And they give me a chance to experience something very, very different. And that's really powerful. And I, and I love that. And I highly, highly recommend that. And look, the good news is so much of this content is now available for you to be able to do that. And people are creating it as well. I mean, it was the whole inspiration behind my team creating this non-obvious guide series, which was designed because the dummies guides and the idiots guides are so useless. Uh, most of them are written like dictionaries. I mean, they're, they're just not useful if you're trying to do something. And if you could read a guide that was written from someone who was a real expert and it read as if you were sitting down and having coffee with them, that would be really useful. And that's the, the inspiration for these guides. And we've got six of them out in the marketplace right now. We've got another eight in development from some amazing authors who many of whom were planning to speak at South by Southwest and were super bummed also that they were not able to, but we're gonna put together a summit with all of them and, and definitely invite all of you once you get on, uh, on the list off of nonobvious.com slash South by Southwest. So go to that link. And by the way, this book, non-obvious guide to virtual meetings and remote work was written during the pandemic. I pulled together expertise and insights from 50 amazing people who all contributed various uh, pieces of advice and things to be featured in the book. And this book comes out next week officially in print. But if you go to that URL, you'll be able to get digitally a free version of the entire book. Uh, so no cost at all. You can download the entire book before it comes out in print next week. If you prefer to wait for print, you can get it anywhere you, you buy books um, online as well. What all of this points to for this particular trend is we have to connect people with knowledge because that can help us stand out. So content marketing, huge, because we can share insights. We can share knowledge and advice and, and help people in a moment when they really need help. And we really need to take advantage of that. All right. Last trend I want to share with you is flux commerce. And flux commerce is the fact that everything in how we do business is shifting from how we get charged for various things to the lines that used to exist between industries that have started to blur and are blurring even faster now because of the pandemic. So if you think about Apple getting into financial services, right, or banks that were opening coffee shops, or Crayola created a makeup line because they were expanding, and makeup is basically painting your face, right? So it makes sense. Makes sense. Taco Bell opening up a hotel. All of these are examples of disruption in how people work and the industries that they feel like they're in. And look, we're in a time now where like that disruption is happening super, super fast. And Part of it is, okay, where is this going to go? And sure, it would be great to be able to know where it goes, but it's even better to have the sort of mindset where it doesn't matter. I mean, imagine that. Like, imagine it doesn't matter where it goes because you know that you're so resilient and that you're paying attention to what's happening in the world enough 
that no matter what direction things go, you'll be able to come up with a way to adapt for your business or for your career. And that's what I think non-obvious thinking, like this process of being able to see these patterns and open your mind, that's what I firmly believe and what I've seen works to help you be able to do that. And that's super, super important. And I think that, you know, if we can do that, we can really stand out. And, and, and look, the final thing that I want to share with you, and this is a, this is a super quick bonus, is what do we do right now in ta tactically, right? Let's get super tactical. I mean, I know I do a lot of research. I do a lot of this uh, kind of uh, pulling stories together and writing about it. And I teach a class as a, as a professor, but, but I'm not really an academic in the sense that uh, I just talk about theory. I want to give you some real practical advice. So I'm going to give you seven quick pieces of advice. Then I'm going to open it up to questions. I'm going to shut this down and we're going to do some questions. So if you're on the Slido platform, you put some questions in. The team at South by is going to help me moderate some of those and we're going to get to your questions. So super fast on these seven big ideas, right? The first one is be opportunistic. Like take advantage of the stories that are happening right now. There was a story of everybody hoarding toilet paper, right? And then there was the next story where people said, oh, wait, I don't need this much toilet paper. And they tried to return it. And the store said, sorry, we can't take it back because of hygiene and also because you know, screw you, you shouldn't have bought that much stuff in the first place. Probably. They didn't say that, but you know, you know, they were thinking it. Uh, but imagine a charitable organization came in and said, look, you bought too much stuff. Hey, it's okay. We all panic a little bit. Maybe donate it to us. And here's where to donate it, right? Jump into that story. Jump into those opportunities that are already happening. The second big thing is, you know, engage the unreachable. Uh, my wife had a birthday party uh, during the pandemic and it was a bummer because we couldn't bring anyone together. But I went out to a platform called Cameo and I got some of her favorite stars from some of her favorite TV shows and I asked them to record a birthday greeting for her. And they all recorded birthday greetings for her. And along with all of her friends, we put that into a video and we stitched it together. And she had this amazing uh, feeling of love from all of her friends that she couldn't see and from celebrities that she'd been watching that she never expected. So engage the unreachable because guess what? None of them are filming anything right now. They're all sitting at home. So maybe they might be willing to do things they otherwise wouldn't have because they were too busy. Use that as an opportunity. Show your work. Go behind the scenes. I love at the end of every Jackie Chan film, he shows the stunts that went wrong. And by showing the stunts that went wrong, he shows you how much work he puts in to get the stunt right and how often he screws it up before he gets it right. Show your work, just like every math teacher you ever had in school told you, show your work. Get familiar with the tech side. Look, there are people who look at technology and say, I can't figure this stuff out. I don't have an IT person anymore to figure this out for me. I'm just, I'm hopeless with technology. You know what, like that's uh, lazy. Uh, encourage yourself to do better. Like you can figure this stuff out. This is not uh, reprogramming the Mars rover, right? No one's asking you to turn into an engineer overnight, but like figuring out how to get a better camera and plug it into your computer. And hopefully, I mean, I know a lot of stuff is sold out right now, but like you can figure this out. You can, you're not stupid. So don't give up on the tech side. Yes, you have to do a lot more stuff yourself. Yes, you might have to watch some YouTube videos, but you know what, like go watch them. It's okay. You can figure this out. There are smart people who will help you and explain it to you on YouTube. Get help, figure it out. Pivot fast to become relevant. There was a great bookstore um, story from a Dallas bookshop that I'm actually talking to next week that transformed their bookstore into a travel agency and said, book a trip somewhere. And when you booked a trip, you got a book that took you to that place. Really clever, right? Great stuff. There's another farm that's allowing you to book a farm animal for your next Zoom meeting. So in addition to all those little faces that are on your Zoom meeting, you can have a farm animal and just show like a llama for 30 minutes. I mean, who wouldn't want a llama to join their next meeting, right? <laughs> we can pivot fast. We can come up with these fun ideas. Like, let's get creative. Let's be creative. Talk more often and focus on content and value. I talked about this before, like focus on content and value. I've been doing a ton of these. This week, I've probably done 15 uh, sessions through virtual Zooms in terms of individual interviews and talks and things like that. My volume has gone way up. And the reason for that is because I can sitting here and I have content and I can share it and I want to share it. And so I'm doing that more and more. You have that same value that you can do and that you can share also. And the last one is don't panic. It's okay. We can figure this out. We don't know what's coming next. I'm not the one to sit here and say, hey, everything's going to be great. I don't know. I hope it is. Sure, I do. But I don't know. But what I do know is the people who will be able to adapt best are the ones who are non-obvious thinkers, who don't panic, and who pay attention to what's happening and try to continually change. 
And that's what I'm trying to do. And that's what I hope you do. And that's what Isaac Asimov talked about doing when he said, be a speed understander and not a speed reader. So the final thought I'll leave you with is this place to connect with me. So in addition to going to this site to get a free copy of the book, all of my slides, watch all of the past virtual, uh, watch all the past real life featured session presentations from South by, get the list of panels and also get a pack with all of the fun stuff that we would have given you during our seven minute meetup and all the other stuff that we were planning at South by, including these awesome shades, which uh, will probably be worth less than they're worth today. But you know, let's be honest, they're, they're not really a collector's item, but they are cool and they are fun and you can get all of that stuff. So if that's interesting for you, get that. If you don't want to spend any money and you'd rather get stuff for free, you can do that too. Okay. No judgment. Do any of these things. I just want to be connected with you. And by the way, that's my email address at the bottom. So if you can connect with me directly, that would be awesome. And like I said, we are going to have a double header today. So if you are not tired of all these things, if you want to know the latest interesting stories of the week, this week, tune into YouTube. This is the uh, link there for my live show at 1.30 Eastern today. And now we're going to open it up, take the last 15 minutes, have some questions, uh, do some Q&A and get to know each other a little bit better. I'll try and answer the questions that, that you pose. If I don't get to your question, uh, please share it on uh, Twitter. Use the hashtag non-obvious or hashtag South by Southwest. I will look it up later. I will try and answer your question on Twitter. My Twitter handle is at Rohit Bargava, just my full name there. Super easy. So you can pose your question there, pose it on Slido either way. So I will hit uh, stop sharing for my screen right now. Now we are full, full screen and I'm going to switch over to get Slido here and I see some questions already. So let me let me start rocking through these. So first question I see here from uh, Sandeep, how do you see schools and colleges changing permanently as a result of this pandemic? Okay, so this is a um, this is a really interesting question that I've been spending a bunch of time thinking about. So one of the ways that I'm seeing school shift is one on one off. Um, and this is particularly for uh, schools that are like um, not higher education, but like younger kids schools. So some kids will go to school one day, some kids will go to school the other day, there'll be an alternating schedule. And as soon as you have something like that, the ideas that have been around for a while from education flip the classroom, those are going to be much, much more important. And, you know, this is a question that not only have we spent a lot of time thinking about, but if you go to my YouTube channel, uh, so YouTube, uh, dot com slash Rohit Bhargava. Just last night, we did a virtual summit on the future of learning where I talked to Mike Palmer, who was the host of a show called Training in Education. And we were planned to talk about that actually at South by Southwest EDU. Um, we had a session there that we were going to do as well. So we did a one hour long conversation about exactly this. So go to YouTube, check that out. It's the uh, non-obvious summit on the future of learning. You should just be able to Google that into YouTube and you'll find that video. You can watch that. Um, all right, next one I see, Vanessa, uh, what is the most non-obvious marketing strategy you've seen a company take during the pandemic? Um, most non-obvious, you know, I'm seeing lots and lots of stories of, uh, of I, actually, you know what, I just wrote about one uh, today and, and I'll be talking about it actually in the, in the show. So this will be like a sneak peek of the, of the show. I'll give it away a little bit, but it was a couple of different restaurants doing really interesting things to reopen with social distancing. So one of them was a German restaurant that was giving people, you know, those long like swimming noodles. They were giving people hats with the swimming noodle on it. And the swimming noodle would kind of show how much space they would need to leave between one another. Uh, there's another restaurant around me here in Northern Virginia um, called Clarity, where he's reopening in the parking lot, and he's gotten permission from uh, the uh, mayor of, of the of the town to reopen in the parking lot and serve food to people and tables outside. Uh, so lots and lots of examples like that, where people are reopening in limited ways that I think are, are, are pretty clever and pretty interesting. Uh, all right, I see a new question from Mikey here. How do you predict trends with such an uncertain future? So this is interesting, right? Because people like to think about trends as being predictions, but really the way I prefer to describe the trends, the way I talk about them is that they're observations. And when you think about an observation versus a prediction, an ob observation is really hard to say, well, how do you observe? Well, of course you observe by paying attention. And that's what I do. And, and when, I, when I share what I think a trend is, it's sort of the same thing as taking flour, eggs, and sugar on a shelf and turning it into a cake. 
Like the flour, eggs, and sugar are already there. Anyone can see them, but not everybody would take them together, mix them, and turn it into a cake. And that to me is what a trend is. And so when I say I predict trends, what I'm predicting is that this idea is going to matter more for people. More people will be acting as a result of it, um, and it'll be influencing behavior. That's the prediction. But the observation is something that's already happening. And I think that's what helps the accuracy of it because I'm not making this stuff up and saying, hey, we're gonna have flying cars when there's not really any evidence you can see right now of that. Instead, I'm saying, here's what I'm observing and here's what I think it means, uh, which is much easier to prove. So uh, we've got a new question here from Tom. Given my view of the importance of experiences, how do companies, brands, or causes respond to an era in which experiences present a public health danger? Yeah, it's a, it, it's a, it's a big challenge because yeah, I, I do believe in experiences and look experiential as a term. It's taken over retail. I mean, experiential retail, it's taken over education, experiential education, but there are ways I think to create virtual experiences for people. And that's what we're stuck with right now. And are they the same as real life experiences? No. Uh, is a virtual meeting better than being face to face? Usually not. Uh, and I think that we have to be honest about it. We can't pretend like it is, but we can create things that are more of an experience for people, right? And I tried in a couple of ways to do that just with this talk uh, in terms of giving you a couple of things to imagine for yourself, trying to make it as interactive as I can, even though I'm sitting here talking and, you, and you're listening. Uh, we can do a little bit to make it more interactive. Obviously, with the platforms, I could do more, right? I could have real life polling. I could have changed my like camera angles to do a couple of different things. I mean, there's lots of things we can do to try and make it more engaging. But at the end of the day, like the experience is, do I get something that, that I remember as opposed to just passively watching? And that I think we can do a little more of in the virtual sense. Um, all right, I see a new question here from Andre. What is not obvious for festivals like South by Southwest from now on? Is it the end of festivals and how do we survive the pandemic in this new world? Uh, gee, I, I sure hope not. Um, I get this question a lot about events. I mean, maybe not necessarily festivals, but you know, what's the future of events? Like, are we going to ever gather together? And what I believe is going to happen is that every event's going to become a hybrid. And there's going to be a way for people to participate virtually. And there's going to be a higher level engagement for people who show up in person. And people are going to be much more selective about what they choose to go to. But the upside of that is when people are more selective about what they choose to go to, when they actually get there, they're much more invested in being there. They don't just show up for the conference and then take the whole morning off and sleep late or like not hang out with anyone else. Like they're really into being there because otherwise they wouldn't have made the effort to show up there in the first place. And I think that that's what's going to happen with a lot of these events. Like the people who show up are gonna be much more invested and yeah, the events are probably gonna be smaller and maybe the digital component of them gets much, much bigger. So overall, maybe as an event organizer, you have more people engaged. And some of the things that we did in the past in terms of recording content and releasing it months later, uh, which is, you know, what Ted did. And, and let's be honest, I mean, that's what South by Southwest did for some time too, because they just had so much content. Uh, that's going to be different because now we're going to release it right away because people are participating right away. All right. Um, next question here. What trends do you anticipate might occur as a result of virtual audience fatigue? Uh, a bunch of things. So first of all, talks are going to be shorter, uh, for sure. Talks will be shorter. Uh, the second thing I think people will realize is you can't schedule this many things back to back and expect people to be able to pay attention. It's not like a real life event where you can fill a whole day of programming and maybe people take a break for a coffee once in a while, but they, they come to this whole thing and they move to different rooms and stuff like that. I think the other thing is, is the movement of people. So yes, the movement of screens in terms of making these talks more cinematic and we're going to get better about doing that and moving cameras and things uh, is going to be a piece of it. But the other piece of it is get people into breakout rooms, which you can currently do right now. Let them have discussions and then come back out and listen to people and then share videos, bring in different content. Like all of these things are going to be ways that we keep people more engaged and change uh, events and the nature of events virtually. Um, so I've got a question here from Shosh, which trends are more popular in red states and why? 
which trends can impact global warming and how to leverage them? Uh, so there's really two interesting questions there. Um, what trends are more important, uh, more popular in red states? I mean, I think it's hard to make these broad generalizations, I think, because there's people in, in, I mean, anytime you say red state or blue state, like, what does that mean? It's, I think there's a bigger divide between people who live in rural areas and people who live in cities. Uh, and that tends to be a bigger divide to me between like various states. But one of the things that I am definitely seeing is this question mark of how much does individualism trump the good of the whole? And how likely is someone to believe that what they're doing is having a positive impact on society, right? Which is one viewpoint versus the person who says, you can't tell me what to do. Uh, I am responsible for myself. And I don't believe that you should be the one dictating all of these things to me about what my kids should do, what I should wear, whether I should do any of these things. And look, you might disagree with that and say, well, those people are just being selfish. Or you might disagree with the other side and say, those people are just being naive. I have my own viewpoints, right? But what I don't do uh, what I try not to do is just dismiss anyone who thinks in a different way about this as being stupid. I mean, there are, look, there are uh, people who believe stupid things. There are people who question things that are facts, and I don't think that's right. But if someone has looked at what they know and said, look, this is what I believe and this is what I think, and that's different from what you believe and think, then we should talk about it. We shouldn't just assume that they're idiotic. Uh, and I think that that's what happens way too much right now. Uh, how do I take personal bias? So next question is, how do I take from Lauren? Uh, how do I take personal bias out of analyzing and sharing trends? Uh, a couple of ways. One is conversation. Uh, I try and talk to people who don't think like me and I'm lucky because I have more of them perhaps in my network just because I meet so many people at so many different events or I used to back when we had events. Uh, but now they're all part of my network. So I get to interact with people from really all over the world. The other is that I have lots and lots of different sources of information. I mean, I'll read New York Times, I'll read Fox News, I'll read uh, emails from every, both presidential campaigns because I'm on both lists. I mean, I get input from every side, whether I agree with it or not. And, and that's one of the ways that I try really hard to remove bias from, from what I'm writing about and what I'm talking about. So we've got another question here from uh, Nicolette. Uh, wow, you guys have lots of questions. So definitely, uh, we definitely won't be able to get to all of them. So uh, please do uh, send me an at message with the question. Uh, use the hashtag not obvious. Use the hashtag South by Southwest. And uh, I will answer as many of them as I can on Twitter after I do the double header show later on. So the question from Nicolette here, how do I determine when a trend is something I should follow or something I avoid? Does following a trend equal getting lost in a crowd? It's an interesting, interesting thought. I mean, I, I don't know that I would ever describe a trend as something that you follow necessarily. The way I usually think about trends is as a spark that leads to an idea. And so, yeah, you, one of the things that you spotlighted in your in your question, um, which I think is really interesting and, and, and a great thought, is the anti-trend. So some people will say, oh, this trend is really taking off and everyone's paying attention to this. So I'm going to do the exact opposite, right? I'm going to focus on the exact opposite. So if you think about like what uh, fast food chain Arby's did, uh, one of the things, oh, sorry. Um, uh, I hope you didn't panic with my countdown timer there. Uh, my camera tends to shut off after a little bit and then I have to shut it back on. Um, but wait, no, that's not right. Turn it back on. Yes. Uh, one of the things Arby's did is uh, when everybody was talking about being a vegetarian, they doubled down and said, we are all about meat. We only have meat. We don't understand people who don't eat meat, right? And that would be like an anti-trend. Like they went against what a lot of people were talking about because it helped them stand out. And so there is a way to really focus on like the macro idea. Um, and uh, the last question I'm seeing here is from Melanie says, what advice would you give to someone who's just graduated from college during this pandemic? Wow, that is, that is an interesting time to graduate. And by the way, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing maybe you did just graduate. So first of all, congratulations. Um, that's really uh, amazing. I'm sorry that you probably didn't get a graduation ceremony, um, which is a, a bummer, um, but congratulations on the hard work it takes to do that. Uh, I would say a couple things. One is, come up with an, you probably had a plan for what you were going to do during the summer, uh, maybe an internship, maybe it got changed, maybe it got canceled. 
come up with a way that you could go back to them and say, look, I can do these things virtually. Um, and more than that, instead of trying to salvage something that's maybe not going to happen, go to the people in the industry of the space that you want to work in who you think might be unreachable right? Who would never respond to your email, who would never respond to your tweet. Look at what they've done, pay attention to what they're doing, and then ask them something interesting. Like show them that you've paid attention to what they've done and get on their radar. Because I guarantee you a lot more of those people who would have been way too busy flying around the world uh, have more time now, which is a golden opportunity, I think, for anyone who's younger to say, look, I'm just going to reach out to them. And because like, what's the worst that happens? They ignore you, which maybe they would have done anyway. But now you have this moment where maybe they won't. And now you've made a connection to someone who's really, really influential and you can ask them for advice and you can share ideas with them. And who knows, maybe it leads to something. So thank you for everyone for all of these amazing questions. I really appreciate you. I appreciate the time that you have taken to uh, come and uh, share a little bit of your day with me. Um, I hope that you are able to join me for this uh, non-obvious show, which is the double header that's coming up. And this is the URL, once again, to be able to join that show. So I hope you can join me for that. I hope you found value from this. Definitely shoot me an email and let me know uh, or get in touch with me directly and post your questions on Twitter if you haven't already, and I will get to those. I appreciate you. I appreciate the entire team at South by Southwest and always stay non-obvious. Mm -hmm.